Welcome, mentioners. We are live. Uh, joining me tonight for this Mentionables live stream, I'm, of course, Caleb Johnston. And down below me here, Joel Furches. Yo. And over here to my right, I'm Clinton Wilcox. Welcome, gentlemen. Glad, glad you could join us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, that intro. Hey, I usually don't make it, but. Yeah, that Decided intro basically, to come in tonight. That that intro basically guarantees that John Dunbar will be on every show that we do. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. He has he has made a couple of appearance on those recent uh, unapologetic recommendation shows. So yeah, I feel like I did an episode with him specifically at one point. Can't remember what it was about. Yeah, I, I've been on two or three where where John was with us physically. <laughs> oh virtually. yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that will be conference twenty nineteen. Sadly, we're not going to do a conference twenty twenty. Yep, I think I think it was supposed to be uh, this weekend or next weekend, wasn't it? Originally? Yeah, coming up yeah. soon. Um, yeah, the the quarantine kind of had other ideas. Sadly. But it's all right. We're not done yet. Yep. You recently made an appearance in a uh, live streaming conference, right, Clinton? I did. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, but, uh, you know, one of my Facebook acquaintances uh, sent me a message one day asking if I would do a, uh, a breakout presentation at a virtual online conference he was doing, which was called uh, something like the... Uh, Christian leaders through COVID-19 or something like that. It was essentially just an online conference uh, that, uh, that, you know, anyone could watch regarding, re regarding various aspects. I don't think, I don't think as far as I remember, or yeah, I don't, I don't remember really specific topics related to COVID-19, but there were, you know, a number of, uh, of, of scholars and experts in various topics. Paul Copan did a talk. Um, Lydia McGrew did a talk. Uh, Rob Bowman did a talk and a, a few others names, you know, people would recognize. And yeah, I did a, a breakpoint session during that conference. So that was the first virtual conference I'd ever done. And Very what, cool. what was yours on? What did you speak about? Uh, mine was on why all human beings are equally valuable. And oh. so all of those talks are still available if, you know, people can go and, and watch them. I do believe you have to actually join, which, which, um, which requires a, a financial contribution. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how much, but you know, all, all the money goes towards future conferences and paying some of the speakers and and things like that. So, you know, yeah. So, so it should still be available. Uh, you know, if someone's listening to this and uh, wants to know how they can go and watch that conference, they can actually just you know send me an email afterward or find me on Facebook. My email is Clinton at ProLifeTraining.com, uh, and I can I'll find out how to to watch those and get back to, to whoever is interested. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll see if we can't find um, a link for it and I'll drop it in the video description as well. So after this okay. stream or maybe even sooner, hmm. um, I'll have, I'll have that up in the description if I can. So that'll make Fantastic. it even easier for them. Yeah. All right. So shall we talk about tonight's topic? Let's do it. What is tonight's topic, Joe? So we only have one topic tonight. And uh, we're going to be looking at a recent article that was published by the American Atheist Society, uh, wherein they did their own study, so to speak. Um, and the title was Reality Check, Being Non-Religious in America. And the survey that they did, they did an online survey where they highly publicized it through their various media feeds to try to get as much participation as possible. And then you had a number of atheists that came on and took the survey. Um, and the survey was aimed at trying to um, gauge how these particular atheists that took the survey felt about their acceptance in society and about, you know, their daily lives and how a religion affected them and so forth. 
and and, and you said this about. you said this was uh american atheists that did this survey yes, right the, the organization american atheist society or aas which i could abbreviate as 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 all right well, this was, uh, from my understanding, too, this was a pretty big survey as far as surveys go. Yeah, they they got a really impressive response to it. I, uh, I had the number, but I can't see it right now. I think uh, it was in the 30-some thousand. Yeah, okay, it was 30... 34,000. Yeah, that's right. So 34,000 participants, and basically it was an online poll that you came in, and you would click on the various, you know, answers that you wanted to give to the various questions that they asked. And then they uh, took the results and they published them uh, very recently, like a week or two ago at this point. So this is hot, blazing hot news that we're on top of tonight. Yeah. Good. That's a, that's a good thing. We're, we're uh, sometimes a little ways behind. So glad we got something hot and fresh off the presses to discuss tonight. Yeah. You want to you want to lead us in kind of introducing us to this thing? Sure. So the, uh, the article that was published based on this study um, it boiled down to two essential points. Um, those being that atheists are widely persecuted, and we'll talk about their definition of persecution. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interests of atheists are underrepresented in the public forum. Um, so I'll read a quote from the article, uh, they said, quote, it is our goal to use the data acquired through the U.S. Secular Survey, uh, the very voice and power of the non-religious community to ensure the future of the secular movement and to allow us to fight for religious equality, the separation of religion and government, and the civil rights of non-religious people for decades to come. And so that more or less uh, sums up how they intended to use uh, the data that they collected from that survey. Yeah, that was their goal mm. at the outset. So this was not a scientific study. This wasn't, you know, for publication in a journal or anything like this. Uh, they state in the survey um, that they were gathering these data in order to be used uh, to further their political goals, as I just wrote. Uh, read you. So if, if uh, so, if science is the is the only arbiter of knowledge regarding truth, then why should we believe this survey if it's not scientific? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's an interesting uh, point. Now, um, the one I'm, thing I'm just I, saying, I'll give them points uh, on two things. First of all, they got an impressive sample size. Um, you know, thirty four thousand is, you know, many scientists would uh, kill to get that kind of participation in one of their studies. Mm. Um, and the other point that I'll give them is that they were honest about the um, <sighs> trustworthiness of the results, that, you know, this was not what you would call a scientifically rigorous survey. And by that, I mean that there was no possibility of screening the participants, um, which you would want to do in sort of a social uh, study like this. You would need to approach uh, the study, if you were doing it for academic purposes, mm -hmm. with a definition in mind of the type of participants that you wanted. You know, so I would define atheist as, you know, a person that does X, Y, Z, comes from a background, and you would design some kind of uh, pre-screening process in order to get the kinds of participants that would accurately reflect the data that you're looking for in the study. Uh, they had no way of doing that. These were all self-reported. It was just some guy on his computer that jumped on and clicked the buttons on the survey and submitted. So they were not able to screen their own participants. It was, you know, kind of a honor system. So that would be a killer if you were trying to get this published. Um, and, uh, well, I'll read a, a quote from them because they, they were very upfront with this, and I appreciate that. Um, 
it, it says, quote, to be clear, this isn't a survey about all atheists in America. You'd need a lot of money to pull that off. This is a self-selected group of people, the kind who are willing to take this sort of survey online. Um, now, here's the important thing about that. All right, so I'm doing a study on um, deconversion, right? And in order to select the people that I'm profiling from the study, I have to gather them from sources that I have access to. I can't collect a random sample of people and, and run them through a screening process or anything. So when I'm profiling people, I'm doing it from things like, uh, you know, ex-religious or ex-pastor, you know, blogging sites or from YouTube sites that uh, where people just kind of give their exit money um, or from these podcasts that interview people who've come out of religion and so forth. And the limitations that I'm dealing with there are the any conclusions that I uh, gain from these studies are only um, applicable to people who get on and talk about their experience. You know, the types of people who will write blogs about their experience or interview and in shows about their experience or go on YouTube and talk about their experience. So, you know, any kind of things that I'm able to say about the results of my studies are only applicable to the sorts of people who like to talk about their um, deconversion experience. Uh, and I've talked to Caleb about this, I believe, that there is a good chance there is, there is a silent ma majority of people who've gone through a deconversion experience and don't want to talk about it. And they just kind of avoid the subject of religion, you know, and I wouldn't be able to find any, I wouldn't be able to draw any conclusions about that kind of person because they're not out there advertising their deconversion experience to everyone. Um, now, I say that to reflect back on this survey. What they're saying is they could only apply the results of their survey to the type of person who would, you know, who is tracking the American Atheist Society um, on social media, and then the type of person who would go to that website and take the survey online, you know. So that's that kind of, it, it's an exclusive group of people. Um, that you would be able to apply those results to. And they stated up front. So, uh, you know, I'll give them points for that, that they're honest about the limitations of the study. Yeah, I mean, I noticed in, in going through things and, and looking at their methodology that they provided from the information uh, that we were at least given on things, you know, it was it was you know, fairly upfront, standard kind of stuff for a survey, standard limitations, all that stuff. Nothing like way out of the ordinary in terms of research wise. Now, I would love to see their full data set because uh, that's something that's always lacking from anybody that seems to post survey results online. They, they limit their data set. And so whether or not we have all the information they gained um, is is a is a big question mark here. Yeah. So this was not an academic study. You know, they stated in the article that the data they were gathering were for political advocacy purposes. Um. So, you know, having that in mind up front, you can kind of look at the way that they're giving the results of the study and the kinds of things that they're focusing on. Um, so the people who were responding to the study, they were largely uh, within the so-called Bible Belt and in the state of Utah, which is highly Mormon. Um, and the bulk of the participants came from religious homes and after becoming non-religious, either felt the need to hide their non-religious leanings or felt the loss of family and community, you know, affected them after they revealed their new identity. So that kind of puts the ball in my court because I couldn't say that, you know, all of these individuals were uh, deconverts. You know, it's possible that they were raised in a religious home, but then they didn't really buy into the religion thing themselves. But there's a good chance that you're looking at a sizable number of deconverts there, people who, you know, identified as Christian through most of their 
childhood, you know, adolescence, early adulthood, possibly, and then eventually um, left religion and were put in this uh, position of having to reveal to their entire community that they no longer believed, uh, which would explain a lot of the results that they're getting there. All right. So uh, these guys are experiencing a loss of community, and this results in a feeling of isolation. So this I can relate to the studies that I've been doing. Um, when somebody deconverts, typically the person who's deconverting is heavily invested in the religion. If they're not, it's more of a disaffiliation. They decide that, you know, to wander away from the church that they, you know, go to on Sunday, but they're not really heavily involved in the community. And so they decide to go do something else because they're, they haven't attached their identity heavily to their religious observances. Then it doesn't result in this huge shift in identity where they're coming out and having to reveal that there are non-believers you know, they're just a person who was occasionally in the pew that kind of wandered away and hung out with their golf buddies or whatever. Um, you know, they, they didn't have this identity heavily tied to their religious, their religion. When you deconvert, you tend to move from um, pretty religious, pretty uh, involved in a religious community to not religious at all. And this, this is a huge deal because you're changing your identity. You know, who am I now that I am not a Christian? And then you're also losing a community because you have to... Um, when somebody deconverts, well, let's start this way. When somebody converts, part of conversion, part of, you know, seeing the light, if you will, you know, joining the religious community and everything, involves a shift of your personal narrative. And this is what I mean. Um, we're all pretty familiar with the idea of giving your testimony, you know, and giving your testimony is telling, you know, how you came to be the Christian that you are, you know, and all of the things that led to that point. Um, you know, and for someone like myself and Clinton, and I think even you, Caleb, there's no real, um, you know, sort of uh, Paul's, religious conversion experience where you're on the road and there's this light that shines down and you go from being clearly non-religious to being clearly religious. And this is kind of the standard testimony that you would hear is God brought me out of X and brought me into Y. Um, and when you have that kind of experience, you look back on all your life prior to being Christian and you see it differently. You see this idea that you were being uh, kind of pushed and prodded in the correct direction, that God's you know, purposes were being worked through your life to bring you to this point of salvation, um, which kind of frames your entire life in a different light based on your new identity as a Christian. The same thing happens when you deconvert. You've got to look back on your Christian life and all of these things that you were convinced of, all these uh, things that you truly believed uh, when you prayed and you felt that you were actually talking to God, when you were taking uh, communion or you were baptized or, you know, whatever your personal religious experience was, at one point this was very real to you. But when you deconverted, you have to then go back and make sense of all of those experiences that at one point were positive experiences for you and that you believed. And so this is your deconversion narrative. And the deconversion narrative looks back over your religious experience and starts to um, reconstruct it as a, a series of lies and deceptions and so forth. All right. So ha have either of you ever seen the movie The Usual Suspects? No. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been a while, but I've seen it. Okay. So for those who have seen The Usual Suspects, uh, mm -hmm. basically... You know, there's this group of criminals that are rounded up for something. And then one of them, you know, most of the movie is one of them sitting in front of the police officer telling the story of, you know, the crimes and the various situations that led up to this event. And so he tells this long and complicated story um, of everything that happened up to this event. 
And at the very end of the story, after he's released, the police detective starts looking around and reviewing the story in his mind and reconstruct. And he realizes that the entire thing was an elaborate deception. And he starts putting the pieces together and realizing what the actual story was. Um, and so, you know, I, I bring that up to compare it to what a deconversion narrative would be. It's like taking this entire story that you thought was one story and realizing that it was an elaborate deception and putting the pieces together and seeing that it was a completely different story. And so that's your deconversion narrative. That happens, and then you have to find what your new identity is. So there's sort of an identity crisis that occurs to somebody who was very convinced about their religion and is now you know, convinced that their religion was wrong. Um, and so there's this identity crisis, and then there's this loss of community, because if you're heavily invested in your religion, you've got a religious community, your friends, your family, these are the people with whom you've associated, and you've got to reconstruct your identity, but then they also have to reconstruct your identity, because they've only ever known you as a fellow Christian, as kind of an advocate within the community that is now outside of the community, and they've got to figure out who you are, even as you are trying to figure out who you are. So you can see it's a very difficult process for the person who is going through the deconversion. You get it? Yeah, absolutely. That would be, I mean, that'd be very difficult. I mean, you're, you're having to, you know, not only work through the, the reconnections and new connections in your mind as to how things have played out in life, but you're also going through this massive community shift at the same time or yeah. loss of community and no new community. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is another respect in which uh, deconversion kind of differs from disaffiliation, because if you're a guy who has some drinking buddies or golf buddies or, you know, everything else. And then, you know, you kind of attend church. There's sort of a Christian group that you're around and then you kind of drift away and, you know, you end up associating more with uh, the people that you already interact with in a secular community and less with the Christians. It's not this big identity shift. You just kind of shift to, you know, you've compartmentalized various aspects of your life and you just kind of discard one of the co Apartments, and it's not this huge, you know, crisis or process. You've just kind of drifted away uh, versus a deconversion where you've, you know, made a radical shift in your identity. And so this results in kind of a feeling of isolation um, because, you know, you've lost everything. Um, and so in the article, it's saying that these atheists feel very marginalized but not just in their immediate community, they feel marginalized, according to the study, in America, which they see as a highly Christian nation. So they just don't fit in. Now, I've never had this sense that, you know, America is so Christian that somebody who's not a Christian wouldn't fit in. Do you? <laughs> no, um, because... My idea is that if, if Christianity is properly lived out, then uh, that, that would make people of all faiths welcome. Uh, because, you know, Christians believe in, uh, in the freedom to worship as you want to worship. You know, um, we believe that there is one, tr one religious truth, but we're not going to force anybody to worship God. Because, you know, I mean, number one, you can't save someone by forcing them to affirm what you believe, um, not even affirming the virgin birth. Uh, number, <laughs> number two, oh. yeah, uh, that, was, that was for you, Nick. Um, number two is... Um, you know, it's it's not like that. It's not like it's going to be attributed to them if we force them to go to church. It's not like they're earning brownie points with God because they still don't believe in their heart. And so, yeah. So, so Christians believe that you know, as Jesus taught, do unto others as you would have them do unto unto you. I wouldn't want to force someone. Uh, I wouldn't want an atheist to try and force me to live like God doesn't exist. I wouldn't want a Muslim to try and force me to go to a mosque every every 
every Sabbath. Uh, so by the same token, I'm not going to force someone to go to, to church every week. I'm not going to force them to pray uh, or all those kinds of things. So I believe in allowing them the freedom to worship uh, who they want or not worship uh, who they want. So um, properly understood, I think that's the way that uh, that Christianity would would um, would ground uh, religious freedom, essentially. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just let people live however they want, because there are such things as rights, and they are philosophically defensible. So, you know, we we, sh we shouldn't allow a, a Satanist to, you know, sacrifice a you know a child to to Satan or something like that, uh, because that's obviously harming slash killing somebody else. But when it comes to things that aren't going to harm uh, anybody else, I think we could allow them the freedom to to do or not do the things that uh, that are in line with their conscience yeah but you know i mean the the sense i'm getting from the survey is that they believe that they're sort of surrounded by christians everywhere and that they're kind of isolated um in that respect you know and i i live in the state of maryland which is a pretty blue state um and so, you know, in most places that I've ever worked or gone, I haven't gotten the impression that everybody around me was Christian. Uh, for the most part, I've, you know, gotten the impression that I was probably the only Christian in the room at that time. Um, but apparently these, the people taking the survey largely believed that, you know, there were more Christians in the room and that they were one of the few non-Christians in the room. Or at least that's the impression given by the phrasing in the in the survey. Um, did you get that impression, Caleb? Yeah, yeah, I definitely got that impression as well. And like you said, that's something that is, you know, in part, many Christians are are to blame for that because I know myself, for example, for many years. You know, Sunday I was in church. I'd read my Bible, but. You know, come Monday morning, I didn't act any different than anybody else. So, mm -hmm. you know, I when I really had growth in my walk, you know, I, I began to feel the same way that, you know, am I the only Christian that works here? Because I haven't noticed these kind of things from other people. I haven't seen these kind of interactions from them. Um, and you know, it's it's easy to feel like an outsider in a lot of environments, especially when you have something that's that's very important to you, um, which I think particularly in this study, you've you've got that. All these were people who are probably following the social media page of American Atheist or at least some connection there. They're willing to take a survey about their atheism online. So, you know, it at least means something to them in and it's not just a, a casual thing of somebody who's tossed religion to the side and then goes on not concerned about what their beliefs are. You know, this clearly meant something to them. So I think, you know, you probably get that outsider sense in the same way. Yeah. And they noted in the study that, you know, uh, Christians have this persecution complex as well and think that, you know, the whole world's against them. And I don't think that that's necessarily untrue in all cases. Um, you know, I feel as if if you watch television shows and look at the news and, you know, see, say, the Golden Globes or the Oscars, there is this sense that Christianity is somewhat underrepresented um, in at least the media portion of the country. So, yeah, I mean, on both sides, it appears that there's the sort of persecution uh, complex or the idea, at least, that you're being marginalized to an extent. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely think there's some of that going on. Uh, I mean, we can just take the quarantine as an example. I mean, how many Christians have we seen, uh, you know, claiming that they're being oppressed or having their rights taken away because uh, the, the city has said, uh, you know, we can't have... Uh, anyone meeting in public, especially if you have groups of 10 or more. And so there, there's, there's been a lot of, uh, I, I think a lot of wrongheaded um, complaints about this, about how it's religious persecution against Christians, which I don't think it is. Uh, Christians weren't being singled out. In fact, religious people weren't being singled out. People couldn't go to work uh, and, you know, kids couldn't go to school. So it wasn't specifically religions being uh, 
being singled out. So I don't think that it was a case of religious persecution, but there certainly were, or it's just, and still are a number of Christians who are kind of acting like it is. So I, I think there's definitely some of that. I, I, I also think it's, I also think there's a lot of real persecution though, especially if you look at other countries, uh, Christians in China, for example, are largely persecuted. In fact, they made it illegal to hold church services in China um, online. So the, so the Chinese uh, Christians who couldn't meet in person couldn't even uh, stream their services online. Uh, and, and many countries um, that aren't America uh, are also uh, killing Christians. So I think there definitely is a lot of Christian persecution, legitimate persecution. And I think there's even legitimate persecution in the United States as well. Someone like Jack Phillips, who uh, just, just because of his personal beliefs is being persecuted, not just by um, by people who don't agree with them, but also by the state of Colorado itself, who've been, you know, who've gotten a slap on the hand by the Supreme Court two or three times now because they have the because they're going on a witch hunt against uh, Jack Phillips, uh, and so he is is quite literally facing uh, pressure to to stop. Uh, to stop essentially living by his his uh, Christian convictions or lose his livelihood, lose, lose his ability to feed his family. So I think that that is a legitimate form of persecution, even if it's not as bad as, look, we're going to kill you if you don't recant your Christianity. So I, I do think there are legitimate examples of persecution, even in the United States. But you know, we, we have to properly understand what actual persecution is. And I think f for the most part, I think there are, are a lot of a lot of Christians who um who often feel attacked and, you know, rightly so, you know, the, the media often does it. Uh, Hollywood movies uh, actually do it. That's why I was really happy to go see Get Out. Uh, I really enjoyed that movie because for once it's the liberals that were being attacked and not conservatives. Um, but uh, yeah, so, but yeah, even like Hollywood movies, you know, attacking conservative Christians, that's not really persecution. Uh, you know, so I, I think we really need to have a good understanding of what persecution actually is. Yeah, and I think that we over-select somewhat towards these highly publicized uh, stories, you know, so we see something like uh, what you were mentioning with Jack Phillips, and then we kind of generalize that to think the whole world's against us or something like that, and, you know, that's kind of an over-selection towards the minority of cases, um, and, you know, to an extent, well, okay, I was about to say it's possible that this is what's going on with these atheists, but honestly, I don't see any highly publicized instances of atheists being marginalized or persecuted or so forth. You just mm -hmm. really don't see that. Atheists aren't very visible um, in the media that I'm aware of. Yeah, and I suppose maybe an atheist could possibly make that argument that atheists are marginalized because they don't feel that they have that you know they're that, that essentially they're they're not they don't feel it's safe enough to actually out themselves as atheists and so i suppose an atheist could make the make the argument that that itself is a form of marginal marginalization against atheists yeah it's weird because in the study they've made the claim that you know atheists are not trusted um and that they're less uh, you know that uh they're less likely to get a job if they revealed they're atheists and you know, they're less likely to be um, sure. voted into political positions if, you know, it's known that they're an atheist, which seems strange to me because I haven't seen that kind of thing. But then again, I'm not an atheist, so. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, I, I can see maybe not getting a job at a church, which is reasonable if you're an atheist. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, revealing yourself as an atheist would, you know, basically uh, kind of take some job opportunities off the table, but I, I don't see why you would want to work those jobs anyway. Um, and yeah, you know, a lot of, I've heard a lot of people say that they would not elect an atheist to public office. And to be honest, I'd be a little leery about that too, because I would want to uh, elect someone that I was confident would defend my natural rights. And atheism is not a worldview which can actually ground natural rights. So when it comes to electing an atheist to public office, I can actually see the argument for why you would at least, uh, why it would at least give you pause if you knew the candidate was an atheist, because you couldn't guarantee um, that person would actually stand up for your rights, especially, especially when it comes to the right to uh, to follow your religion. Because we're, right now we're seeing a big uh, tug of war between uh, between the, the political left, which is pro-abortion and uh, pro-gay marriage, pro you know 
trans rights, and then you have the the religious right, which is anti-abortion and believes marriage to be between one man and one and one woman. Uh, doesn't believe that uh, that your gender is malleable. Uh, those kinds of things. And so, uh, if we elect an atheist president, for example, will he take the side of um, you know, not forcing business owners to uh, to provide contraception that that m may uh, do an early abortion, or would we also, or would that president also stand up for the rights of a conservative business owner to uh, you know to to not participate? Uh, you know, not not give his his uh, talents to uh, to a ceremony like a gay marriage that he doesn't believe it is moral, even if he um, serves uh, serves gay people in all other capacities. Could could we guarantee that an atheist we elect to public office will defend our rights to to do those kinds of things? And if the answer is no, then I can see why someone would um, would possibly not elect an atheist to public office. Because uh, to summarize, number one, their worldview does not allow the grounding of natural rights, which which, which our our entire um, our entire political system our, our entire nation is founded on and number two we can't necessarily guarantee that atheists will stand up for our rights even if it's a right he doesn't believe in or doesn't agree with so I can kind of see that that argument there okay so I'll come back on that a little bit the first thing I'll say is I don't think I could easily see uh, what you just said being, taken in, you know, in the typical misunderstanding of the argument that says that atheists are immoral people, you know, right, you, you can't be moral that. unless you believe in God. Right. Um, and that's a common misunderstanding of that. You know, basically, I would put it this way. The very fact that atheists are moral people points to a grounding for morality. You know, there must be such a thing as morality that allows these atheists to be moral. And I think many of them are. Most that I have met have some kind of moral standard that they're very, um, you know, they, they stick to consistently and they're very loyal to this moral standard. So I don't think that atheists are necessarily immoral people. Many of them are very moral. But the fact that they're moral points to the fact that morality exists and must have some kind of grounding. Um, so that's how I would put that argument. Secondly, I'll go on record and say, as saying that I have no problem voting for an atheist into a public office if I look at their platform and I agree with it. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that they're atheists doesn't really factor into me. I am looking for what they stand for and if they're uh, representing my rights. So. Yeah, and I, I can see that too. Like I, I can see myself voting for an atheist, Republican, or Libertarian just because the party platform is there and uh, they want to make sure that they're they're keeping their their voting base uh happy um but when it comes down to is it an, uh, you know like for example an atheist republican versus a christian republican who then will you vote for will the atheism then uh weigh more heavily into you, into your vote mm, i don't think it would because i've seen you know many politicians who wave their christian bona fides around as mm -hmm. just a method of getting into office to try to kind of win over that base again i would be looking at the things they're saying and you know their history in office the kinds of things they've voted on and if it represented the you know my if it represented me as a citizen uh, and they were standing up for the types of rights that i was interested in i wouldn't have a problem voting for them yeah yeah, sorry, I kind of cut you off there, uh, Caleb. I wanted to try and, and get my uh, my follow up there in real quick, but no, uh, no, the hope, that's so. all good. Yeah. I was just going to say that um, you know, and I think part of the problem with this is that we've got so many uh, stereotypical behaviors on kind of both sides of things to a certain extent that I think contribute to. Uh, this image and lack of, of willingness to either hire somebody or elect them into office because you've got the kinds of Christians who uh, are, uh, I don't know a better way to put this, of the Ken Ham variety <laughs> in terms of how they act towards people. Mm. Um it says nothing about methodology, nothing about beliefs, just in terms of, of how they treat people. They don't have that First Peter 3.15 gentleness and respect part down. 
And so, you know, you don't believe in God? Well, you must not believe in anything, you know, and, you know, you've got th that kind of stereotype. Yeah, your, then, your mind is so open that your brain fell out. <laughs> yeah, those kind of comments. Right. And then you've got, you know, the angry Internet atheists who are uh, outspoken very often and, you know, well, if uh, if God created the universe, who created God? Um, so, you know, I, I think these stereotypes contribute a lot to both the per perception of how attitudes are going to be and that, you know, because this person's this way, I'm probably not going to get hired here or I feel discriminated against because, you know, this, I, I saw a cross on their wall or whatever. So they must be one of those Christians and they're, they just discriminated against me. Mm -hmm. Same so, thing other way around, I think. Yeah. I, I'd like to speak to the job loss thing because this was a point brought up in the article uh, on more than one occasion. And, you know, I can say this, that there was a great deal of job loss in the profiles that I did for deconversion. Um, but a majority of those worked, you know, their job was in the ministry. You know, they were missionaries, they were pastors, they were, um, I don't know, music leaders and things like that. And so the job loss kind of came along with the territory. If they were going to leave the Christian community, for, they for could the no longer time, work in the for ministry. The last, for the last time, we can't play Judas Priest on Sunday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> um now, there was one profile I did where the gentleman, he was a, uh, a teacher, and he was living in the Deep South. And so when he went from being a very religious person, I think he led a house church or something, um, to you know starting to post atheist memes on his Facebook page and you know visiting atheist sites and things like that, you know, it became apparent that he was kind of shifting in that direction. And so his, you know, he was starting to be questioned by the students that he had, which were all Christians. And then the principal called him into the office and started expressing concerns about him. And eventually he ended up losing his job. Um, I don't know if he left because of the pressure or if he was just fired. But the point is he did lose his job and it was not a ministry job. So I know of one occasion where that happened. Now, I can only see that happening in the Deep South or in Utah, where the majority of the community is Christian. I can't see that happening in California and New York anywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So I, I, I think it depends on where you're at, too, because like here in the Central Valley, I'm actually kind of in the conservative portion of California. Uh, but, you know, when I when I was younger, um, we had a youth leader at my church and the youth all liked him. I liked him. Uh, I wasn't really a youth. I was more uh, I was more helping out at the time. And um, this is actually before I left left the church, uh, that, that particular church. And um, the th but the thing is that he was actually charismatic and uh, and I, I was you know attending a Baptist church. And so the, the, my, the pastor, the associate pastor and the youth leader all had a, a meeting and it was it was a mutually agreed upon decision that the youth leader uh, would leave the church uh, because or at least not not lead the youth any longer because of his charismatic views. And 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 the, the youth leader agreed with the decision because it was kind of a conflict of interest. If, you know, a kid went to him with with a question, he wouldn't be able to give them a, a Baptist answer. He would have to answer according to his conscience. So. You know, so that kind of thing does happen here, but it's not really just limited to atheists. It's just if you're if you're not, you know, if if you're not able to, uh, you know, per perform the functions of your of your job, like if you're at a church and you don't believe in God and you're in a position of authority where someone can come and like a kid kid can come and ask questions and you might damage their faith, it shouldn't be surprising that you won't have that job for very long. And and it shouldn't you know it shouldn't be something that they get upset with either. It should be something they understand. You know, uh, just like I'm, you know, I'm never going to go apply at a, at a at a strip club, you know, because of my Christian convictions. Um, that that's a job that is not Plus, a, you're a, a pretty ugly stripper. 
That, that's true too. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so there is that problem also. I, I, I mean, I was thinking more like bouncer, but yeah, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> uh, but, no, but so yeah, there, there are certain jobs that, that, you know, and like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go and apply to lead a youth group at a, at a, at a mosque either, you know? So it's just as a Christian, there are certain jobs that, that are not available to me. Uh, it, it just ought to be something that we understand, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Those are my things, I guess. So. Yeah. And now just to be clear, unfortunately, the, the article that they published, and to the best of my knowledge, the survey itself, mm. wasn't able to provide any sorts of details in terms of things like job loss. Uh, another one that was a little surprising to me and that I wish I had more details for was physical abuse. I mean, mm. uh, um, a percentage of the results they received from the survey reported physical abuse as a part of their atheism. And I can't think of a single circumstance I, I remember where somebody was actually physically abused for being an atheist. You know, I, I would love to hear the circumstances under which that happened. Um, you know, I could see maybe a domestic abuse type thing. You know, if, if they're in some kind of religious home and they, as a teenager, they decide to deconvert and their mom finds the, you know, some atheist sites on the computer or something you know getting slapped around maybe i don't know <laughs> that's the and best it, scenario i can come up with and it was a relatively large uh percentage in terms of you know not being able to think of an example of it and it was like uh 0.7 percent i think which doesn't seem that large but you know when you look at what that would be you know, 238 people or more in this survey, mm. you know, right. I, I believe it was 0.7% was the, so, I mean, 200 and some people having instances of physical abuse. Mm. Yeah. That's strange. Um, so the, I, I would like to speak a little bit to the marginalization thing, because I think that we have, instances where this could be explained. And uh, one of them was a study um, that I looked at uh, back a while titled The Effects of Religiosity on Life Satisfaction in a Secularized Context. And this was a 2017 study. And basically the long and the short of it was that they found that people who are a minority group, um, in this case it was uh, religious people living in a secularized society. I believe it was Sweden. Um, and, you know, they reported having lower life satisfaction just knowing that most people around them didn't share their beliefs. So what I'm saying is if they go out in the community and they say hi to a stranger or they're working in retail and customers are coming in all day, um, they have to assume that everyone they're talking to and all of their coworkers don't share the same values as them. So there's this sort of inherent idea of isolation that kind of hovers over you all the time because you know that only you hold the values um, that you do in the entire community until you go to church that day. And mm -hmm. then you finally are surrounded by people who hold your values. And so if you were to take the same phenomena over to the atheist side, especially an atheist living in Utah, um, they have to more or less assume everyone they're interacting with is probably, you know, um, Mormon. And uh, so they don't hold the same kinds of values or ideas that you, an atheist, do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that does present a, you know, a loss of life satisfaction that's very palpable only in terms of you know everyone around you disagrees with you, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can definitely see how that would lead to someone being, you know, less satisfied with their life. Yeah. So, I mean, like, just as a point of comparison, in the Deep South, you know, I, I lived in Tennessee for a while, and I lived in North Carolina for a bit. Um, you know, I mean, you're, I was talking to Caleb before the show. You can go into the local Piggly Wiggly, and hear a Christian radio station um, on the overhead. And that's just kind of 
known. And, you know, you can, you know, you walk up to the cash register and you check out and she's, uh, she's like, uh, you know, God bless you. Uh, <laughs> as you're walking out the door, there's just kind of, there's a Christian culture and everybody more or less assumes that everybody else is Christian. And, uh, you know, I used to say that you can't throw a rock in a crowded city without hitting a stained glass window down there. Uh, there's a church on every corner. So, yeah, there's a very different type of culture than perhaps you and I are familiar with, Clinton. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a you know a little bit, yeah, a little bit difficult for me because I, I didn't really grow up around people necessarily who shared my beliefs, uh, even though this is more of a conservative area of California. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cause I, I was, um, I was, I was bullied incessantly in elementary school. And so I know what it's like uh, to feel like you're the only person in the world who, who believes or feels like you do. So uh, that's at least something I can, I can, uh, uh, you know, sympathize with at the very least. So. Yeah. And I mean, I've never been an atheist in Utah or the deep South. I guess it's possible that, you know, you go to school and <laughs> or wherever and everyone around you is Christian and they find out you're an atheist and they start getting abusive to you. Uh, you know, how would I know? I've never been in that situation. Yeah. You know, I'd like to say I, 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 won't, I won't believe it, but, you know, some of the some of the kids I grew up with, even in church, uh, could be could be jerks so you know i i, I don't want to just discount it wholesale you know I, I would like to think it's not true because I, I would like to think that every christian is consistent with their beliefs and that they view all human beings as equally valuable even atheists and other people but considering some of the people i grew up with it's, it's not something i can necessarily just you know unequivocally deny yeah. and like, you like, know in talking about that and we were talking about physical violence just a second ago and, um, you know, I think that actually may account for a good portion of that. So the breakdown uh, for numbers, I was just slightly off earlier. Um, in older individuals, uh, it was 0.6% uh, that had reported physical abuse in some kind, punch, kicked, physically assaulted because of their non-religious identity. But among younger individuals, that was a 3.3%. So some of that may be those type of situations that escalated. Yeah, and if they're older individuals, they could be reporting back to something that happened, you know, several decades ago. Very true. Uh, you know, when life was different and presumably society was a bit more religious at the time. And the way in which people handled that is different than we would now. So, yeah, it might reflect the era in which they grew up. Who knows? I mean, this is all speculation. Right. Um, but, yeah, so let's talk about the, um, the various definitions that they were using when they were talking about this kind of discrimination. And the most uh, fundamental definition they were giving for uh, discrimination was microaggression. Ever hear a microaggression, Clinton? Uh, yeah, um, it's a uh, it, it's uh, it's a word that's been invented uh, in critical theory, and critical theory is not something I take very seriously um, because uh, I, I know better. <laughs> I know better, essentially, um, you know, uh, ba based on based on my own upbringing. Yeah. So their definition of microaggression was quote brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial or other slights and insults to the target person or group. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So like if I, because I, I have a number of Mexican friends, and mm -hmm. if I say to one of them, hey, uh, Andale, <laughs> that, that, would, uh, that would be viewed as a microaggression, <laughs> I, I would yeah. imagine. Yeah, right. So. so, yeah, making anything like that. Um, right. So for the participants in this study, microaggressions could possibly be things like being told, God bless you when you sneeze um, yeah. or, you know, being present when somebody's saying grace over their meal um, or, you know, having to walk into your school and 
somebody's got a uh, is wearing a uh, cross on their neck. Um, you know, this kind of thing. So the microaggressions uh, could be pretty broad in terms of the definition. Anybody who's taking the survey might feel irritated that, you know, it says, in God we trust on the nickel they've got in their pocket. And, mm-hmm. you know, for all I know, that could be a microaggression. I don't want to paint uh, atheists with a broad brush and say they're all ridiculous when it comes to this. What I'm saying is the the definition of microaggression is broad enough that I could see it possibly being overreported on the survey based on the little annoyances that atheists have to deal with uh, on a regular basis. Like, for instance, like I said, in the Deep South, where they're playing Christian radio stations uh, in retail locations. Mm. You know, that could be a microaggression. Yeah. And yeah. And so, so that's part, I think, of the tug of war that I mentioned earlier between, uh, between, you know, two people's rights. Because in this case, it seems, it seems to me, at least patently obvious that you don't lose your rights just because you go into business for yourself. And so it seems like it would be the right of the business owner to play Christian music. And if someone is offended by Christian music, uh, they could shop elsewhere, you know. Um, so I, I don't, I don't see that as any sort of aggression because the the intention on the part of the business owner is not intending any sort of aggressive act, either overt or implied. And so if someone is going to take offense to that and call it a, a microaggression, well, you know, it's kind of like you know, get over it. <laughs> you, you know, uh, the business owner has the right to play that song, and if you don't like it, there are plenty of other places you can go uh, to shop. In fact. Um, my niece has really seems like she's been buying a lot more into critical theory as of, as of late. I don't know if she actually knows what critical theory is. She might just be (laughs) kind of absorbing it from the culture, Mm -hmm. but she has really gone on some Facebook tirades uh, against uh, business owners who play Christian music. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know when she gave up on her Christian faith, uh, but it seems pretty offensive to her now because uh, she she basically told me via Facebook. This was on her Facebook wall, so I, I don't th- I don't think it was supposed to be kept private because it was it was in a public con- public forum. But she she essentially said that it was shoved down her throat for most of her life, and so she's kind of rebelling against it. And so part of that is also being offended by the Christian music. And so mm-hmm. you know, like I, I can understand, but. You know, there there are a lot of other places you could be shopping if you don't want to shop someplace that is playing Christian music. And you know, for me, like you know, I, I joke around about being offended by modern pop music just because so much of it sucks. Mm. <laughs> but, but I'm not literally offended. Offended. You know, like if I walk into a store and they're playing, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, Imagine Dragons, like one of the one of the worst bands ever. <laughs> Um, if they're playing Imagine Dragons, like I'm not going to storm out just because they're playing a band that I can't, that I can't stand. You know, I'll, <laughs> I'll tolerate it. You know, because because I'm an adult. You know, so yeah, I don't know. Well, just to give some kind of idea of you know the microaggressions they're talking about, here's a quote from the uh, paper. It says, in the year prior to taking the survey, nearly two thirds of all survey participants were sometimes, frequently are almost always asked to join in thanking God for a fortunate event. So, you know, Mm. somebody comes along and they're like, ooh, thank Mm. God there was a handicapped parking space near to the building. Yeah, like I can can kind of see that, but I think we also need to understand that a lot of people, when they say stuff like that, they don't really mean any harm, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So I really think you ought to take into consideration um, the, 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 you know, the, the intention of the person is talking to, cause you know, I've, I've heard people come up to me and say, praise Allah for something, you know, and it's <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't believe in, in the Muslim conception of God, but why would I get offended that, that a Muslim is expressing praise for the deity that he believes in? Even if I disagree, I just, I, I don't understand, you know, getting, getting offended over somebody else with differing beliefs. Mm-hmm. So you know, as long as he's respectful of me not being a Muslim and, you know, um, understands that I'm not going to, you know, join in celebrating Allah, but I'm not going to get offended if he if he says that around me, you know. If, even if he's initially asking me to join in, thinking that I might be a Muslim, you know, making a false assumption. And, you know, if he's not hostile about it when I see actually, you know, I, I, I don't really believe in that. Um, you know, I, I, just, I just don't see the issue here. Yeah. So in order to um, 
scale, you know, to judge the level of discrimination that these atheists were feeling. The paper uh, used a previously um, developed scale called the Measure of Atheist Discrimination Experience, um, and then adopted it into their survey. But they did a, um, a focus group prior to doing this, and the focus group decided that in addition to the various things that were already in the scale, that they would add um, seeing religious symbols or text in public places yeah. as a you know benchmark for discrimination. Yeah, oh, actually, um, this uh, this actually just pop popped into my, my head real quick. It's kind of a little bit of a tangent, but it's kind of related. Um, I I used to work at a at a casino, and actually, one of my coworkers every Friday would come in and say T A I F, which for him meant think all it's Friday. <laughs> something that that I just that popped into my my brain just now. So yeah. <laughs> Well, the reason I bring that up, the fact that they added this and the fact that, you know, they state up front that they're using these data to, you know, for political advocacy uh, purposes, uh, it seems like they might be using the survey to angle for, you know, reducing or eliminating any kind of religious symbolism that's, you know, on display in public life. Uh, so I'll read you a quote from the article. Uh, about the political ends for this. It says, while survey participants expressed strong interest in all these policy issues, overwhelming concern was expressed for maintaining secular public schools and about the denial of health care based on religious beliefs. More than four-fifths of all survey, per survey participants expressed strong support for access to abortion and contraception, for opposing religious ex uh exemptions that allow for discrimination, for comprehensive and medically accurate sex education, for protecting environmental and addressing climate change, uh, for protecting youth from religious-based harm, for opposing inappropriate political activities by churches, uh, and for LGBTQ equality. Opposing religious displays on public property was least likely to be rated as an important policy priority. And that was 53% just for measure. So slightly over half were still interested in opposing religious displays on private properties. But if that gives you an idea of the various causes they were angling for with these data, then now you know. So what is this? Uh, oh, importance of various policies. Okay, so th these are basically issues that the, the atheists taking the survey are rating a, as important to them, essentially? Yes, that's yes. right. Okay. Yeah, they were asked, which, what are their important political priorities uh, mm -hmm. as an atheist? And these were the results of those. Okay. Um, and again, oh. remember the paper stated, hey, we're taking this information so that mm -hmm. we have stuff to present when we do political, mm -hmm. you know, activism. Yeah, I would have, um, I would have thought LGBTQ equality would actually be much higher on the list. I well, mean, it's so Still a huge following for it, but uh, it's one of the lower, uh, lower. One of the one of the issues with this is this is, in my opinion, is not a super useful measure here in any degree. Again, this is not scientific, they say, but in looking at this, like almost everybody in the survey, you know, uh, well over three quarters ranked almost everything as being very important. So, you know, while maintaining public secular, secular public schools, 92% of people uh, roughly ranked that is very important. But 80, 82%, you know, said LGBTQ rights were important. So you're only looking at a 10% uh, difference there in the number of people. And they may be in the group who ranked it as, as somewhat important. So it, it, it really doesn't tell us a whole lot because... You, we've only got one issue opposing religious displays on public property that really had a significant variance from, uh, you know, being ranked as very important by everybody. So, I mean, all these were things they found as important. It wasn't like they had some they found important, some they didn't. I mean, everybody sure. put marked the same thing for almost all of them. So not a really useful measure, in my opinion. Hmm. I mean, yeah. I guess if you're looking at, you know, overall participation in the study, here's here's how we've proved that, you know, 
these are some of the top issues people are are struggling with and and are important to them, which I think is the main use in this study. But yeah, the one uh, second from the bottom here, persecution of non-religious people internationally, that actually sounds like uh, sounds like an issue that religious people can get on board with because Mm -hmm. uh, chances are if non-religious people are being persecuted, so are Christians in that country. So uh, helping persecution of non-religious people internationally would also help the persecution of religious people internationally. So that's definitely one that religious people could get on board with, definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, among their complaints, I'll read a quote from the article. It says, some of these states have passed laws to promote false Christian nationalist narratives, allow religious exemptions to civil right protections, and enshrine particular religious views into law. So the sense I'm getting from this is that, you know, at the bottom line, at the end of the day, it's really the political um, bent, the sort of right wing political bent that we're finding as being discriminative here or persecutive. You know, there are so many people voting for right wing policies, and this is a violation of atheist rights. Almost. Yeah, no, uh, at one point towards the end of the study, they they called out specifically Christian nationalist as as being an issue and a big part of the problem. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, any one of these can really merit <laughs> its own discussion. Um, you know, in- inappropriate political activity by churches. You know, what do they mean by that? And do they, do they care about the inappropriate political activity being done by Planned Parenthood? an organization that rakes in millions of dollars of taxpayer money, but is also allowed to lobby for, for democratic politicians, you know? Um, so are they willing to be consistent there? And, um, you know, comprehensive and medically accurate sex education. Well, you know, they're th- just because they believe it doesn't necessarily make it scientific. You know, I'm sure they're considering um, contraceptive in that, but the problem is, is that there's actually good reason to think that, even though it might make sense on the surface that access to contraception actually doesn't lower the rates of, of uh, teen pregnancies or out of wedlock pregnancies or abortions, but actually uh, increases them because it, it, it encourages people to engage in more riskier sexual behaviors because they think that they're being safe. Um, you know, these contraceptions have to be used in the same way each time, especially when it comes to the pill. You have to make sure you're taking it consistently, whereas uh, more than half of all abortions are done because uh, even though uh, even though the, the couple was using, had used contraception in the last month before the abortion took place. Uh, so, you know, there, there are good reasons to think that even, uh, you know, comprehensive, like, you know, contraceptive based uh, uh, sex education doesn't necessarily result in fewer pregnancies, but could actually increase the overall, uh, the overall net number of pregnancies. So, you know, so there's, there's, like I said, any one of these topics could really merit its own discussion. Yeah. So, um, you know, at the bottom line there, they selected for atheists Hmm. for this study uh, for the following reason. They say, quote, Uh, We vote nuns, referring to individuals with no particular stance on religion, don't always vote, but atheists definitely vote. And, you know, I mean, they're right about that. There's a study that was recently released by Ryan Berg, uh, which, you know, showed that atheists are, in fact, the most politically active group in America. You know, so Mm -hmm. there is a base to be motivated here. Um, you know, by these studies and kind of the results and the advocacy that goes along with them, they're looking to try to activate the base and keep it active in order to vote these policies uh, that they align on. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, that's, uh, that's where they're headed with this. Uh, One thing I'll say, you know, we were talking about microaggressions being a um, kind of a a standard for the uh, persecution. Um, One of the things that they really put a a great deal of emphasis on uh, was, you know, the minority groups that were atheists. 
Uh, so they would talk, you know, about the African American population, the Hispanic population, the um, uh, LGBTQ, and the way they kind of built these things into the survey. You, you know, the questions were vague enough that you could take an instance wherein, um, say, a kid came out to his family as gay and his family kind of rejected him um, and his family was also religious. And they could use that as an instance of a violation of the atheist right or a persecution of the atheist. And I would say that that particular persecution, while wrong, wasn't related so much to the atheism as it was to the, you know, him coming out as gay to the family. Um, and the same thing could be, uh, you know, said about the uh, minority groups. So, for instance, if an African-American felt that he had been unjustly treated by the police and happens to be in the deep south where everybody's religious, you know, you could take a racial issue and kind of turn it into an atheist persecution issue with, uh, you know, a helpful turn of phrase. Uh, so, you know, one has to allow for a bit of bias within the survey in that direction. Well, there's there's also another significant problem with the survey in that area. Um, because when you look at the breakdown of the participants they had on the survey, um, interestingly enough, the um, the number of participants who listed uh, white as their race or ethnicity was uh, 92.4%. Uh, that is significantly disproportional from what you know, national census shows for this being somewhere in 70% range. So this, this survey was taken largely um, by uh, white Americans. Um, so again, it has some problems, especially when you get down to looking at, at racial and minority issues, because you've got a much underrepresented uh, population in most most of these from having anything you could extrapolate on a nationwide scale. And to their credit, they weren't against doing that in the study. But, you know, it's it's one of those things, and I did not see them pointed out anywhere, that, you know, they had some population issues in terms of of who they had that, that took the study. While it was very balanced in some areas, uh, particularly when it came to race and ethnicity, it was uh, very disproportional. Yeah. So those were the major points that I wanted to hit on the uh, on the survey. Did you want to go into some of the some more of the statistical or, or numbers information there, Caleb? I've I've kind of touched on most of of what I had noted down here as we went through. Um, yeah. You know, sure. I, go um, ahead, Glenn. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you, you wanted to kind of touch on some of the social aspects. Have we basically touched on everything you wanted to talk about? or? Yeah, more or less. Okay. All right. So, yeah, 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 yeah to, to cover just a couple more kind of random thoughts I had in reviewing this, rather than uh, kind of putting it in, in any other format. Um, you know, it, one of the interesting results, of course, was um, in regards to depression. Um, based on their survey, they had a much higher percentage of uh, depression within the atheists that took this survey than is in the general population. Um, you got to be careful with that number, but it has been backed up by other studies as well in the past. And one of the things with this is, is some of their wording too was also very problematic on these. Um, well, as they are in a lot of studies, you have to kind yeah. of take studies with it with several grains of salt. Um, you know, especially if they, if they prove a particular point of view in a very con contentious uh, discussion, really need to uh, go, go through that study with a fine tooth comb to make sure everything is on the level. Right. And, and they're at least careful in how they word their results, the higher rate of likely depression versus higher rate of depression. Yeah. 
so, you know, like I said, the methodology again is okay, but there are definitely some significant issues as well that kind of, uh, don't invalidate the study, but it makes it a lot harder to get meaningful information from it, aside from just saying, this is, this is a survey we did, mm -hmm. and here's the number of people that did this. But, you know, when you break down and look at, you know, what some of those things are, it, it, it really adds nuance to things. And the other thing I found really interesting as well was how much um, discrimination, if you will, was present in this study against uh, religious groups, particularly against Christians. For example, we were looking at, you know, um, the causes that they found most important. And one, like uh, opposing religious exemptions that allow for discrimination as policy priority. So uh, like with that, a lot of what we've seen in recent years in court cases, from my understanding, is that a lot of those are where, you know, rules have been put in place, uh, particularly within colleges that restricted groups from being able to even discriminate that, okay, this is a Christian group. We need to have Christian leaders for this group. Um, you know, that that's considered a discrimination issue. Um, but as we were talking about with the whole job situation, you know, if, if the job is designed for a certain type of person, then you know, there are certain requirements you have to have to have that job. And if that's if that's religious based, it's religious based. Um, so, I mean, you know, that's one example. Also, I thought it was interesting that um, or you were going to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to add something real quick that it, it really strikes me as odd to think that there might be a Christian in a regular job that would fire someone for being an atheist. Cause I think of, you know, we mentioned, or I mentioned uh, Jack Phillips earlier. Uh, Jack Phillips made headlines because he, he serves gay people, you know, gay, you know, gay people come in, he'll serve them a cake. He'll, he'll sell to them. He just didn't want to, to, to bake a cake and uh, decorate it specifically for their same sex wedding. Um, and, and the thing is that Jack Phillips actually has employed gay people uh, at his establishment. And so for a Christian business owner uh, to, you know, just like own a grocery store or something and not hire or fire someone because that person's an atheist, I really have a hard time seeing a, that a Christian would do that, you know, um, because that because their atheism is not germane to the to the to you know their their job duties essentially so yeah that, that's just kind of all i wanted to, to add there that you know we have evidence that christians don't do that thing so i i would imagine that we are talking about something in which you know they actually had to be religious for to you know for the performance of their duties like having a job at a church or something yeah so yeah um just to kind of touch on something you were talking about Caleb, uh, it, how they use the data and uh, how they use the data collection. One of the things that I noticed in the paper, they were talking about how one of the questions is, you know, within the past um, 11 months, how often have you been the subject of reli religious persecution? And I mean, that's a vast simplicity uh, over what the actual question was it, the actual uh, or, one of the actual questions because i've got this down this was my next note mm -hmm. was um thinking about the past three years have you experienced a negative event related to being secular or non-religious in any of the following types of locations mm -hmm. is this the one where uh with how they treated the word unsure yep okay yeah then go ahead and color that because that stood out to me so in this question, when they asked this question, they were then asked to select yes, no, or unsure. Um, the answer unsure was included because it is common for members of stigmatized groups uh, to be unsure whether discrimination is occurring. Either way, though, um, because they have low expectations about the treatment by others or because of some other form of ambiguity in the situation. So this type of questioning 
is specifically kind of triggering, um, you know, negative memories in some way. It's really a pointed question for one, um, is one of the problems I had with it is you're left with three very obvious options, but then you're asked to recall this for the past three years and think of this circumstance and that circumstance. We're also more likely to remember negative experiences than we are positive ones a lot of the time. So, you know, this is really mining for for anything that possibly could have happened. And then it's it also throws unsure in there um, for that yeah, reason. Like said, as a yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I see some stuff popping up in the chat. Did we want to address any of those? Uh, well, it looks like people had left. We had a couple of uh, listeners early on who, uh, were asking to come on the show and join us. So I was going to find out what they wanted to talk about and see if it was going to be directly related to this conversation we were having, but it looks like they have left at this point. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. If, if you're if you're listening, then uh, yeah, you know, we we wouldn't mind having you on. Um, but usually, we need to wait until the uh, main conversation is over. But we do appreciate you know listeners joining us. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, anybody who's respectful and wants to join in the conversation, we're certainly open to that. Once we get through kind of our main points of discussion, we always love to hear other opinions people may have. So whether they be atheist, Christian, um, pagan. Yeah, or, or whether, you, whether you leave a comment uh, with a question or ask to come on and join us and ask it uh, verbally. Yeah, absolutely. So... Yeah, yeah, so that that kind of covers my main points that I had here as well. Now, Everything else we've kind of talked about in the general discussion. Now, one thing that, you know, I, I think it behooves us to mention is that at least ha a little over half of the discrimination that was reported came from social media. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this isn't solely walking out on the street and... um being told God bless you or something like that. We're talking about a significant portion over half of it dealing with the stuff that goes on, on, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, those places, um, or, you know, various chat boards. And that kind of online situation is sort of conducive to this more heated and, you know, rhetorical kind of abuse, if you will. Um, you know, I mean, and we, we all function within the online sphere, so we know what it's like, and I doubt any of our listeners don't know what it's like uh, to deal with these things. People tend to be a little more outspoken and bold and abusive within yeah. the online arena. So here's, here's something that I, I think is a good example of, of uh, tr trying to, you know, of, of being not, not very careful in... In, in in the in your study, so you might get skewed results here because I'm looking at this little chart they have over here, and it's about negative experiences and discrimination, and the two options they have is experience negative events or not sure. <laughs> so it's like it, it, they're they're kind of assuming that atheists would not be free of these negative experiences for being atheists. They don't even have an option for never experience negative events. <laughs> yeah, so that's another yeah. good point. So that that so that this is one that I would that I would be this is a, this is a study I would be very leery about uh, based on how they ask the questions and you know in, in my own in my own um, you know my my own uh, area of uh, specialization abortion um, there are studies there even by Gallup polls that you have to be careful about because Gallup polls consistently show that Americans are basically split on the question of abortion forty four percent pro choice forty four percent pro life and um, uh, what's that? Eighty-eight percent, like twelve percent unsure, or something. Uh, but then, when you really get down into it, you know, because that doesn't really tell you anything about what people believe. It just tells you, you know, half, you know, uh, forty-four percent identify as pro-choice, forty-four percent identify as pro-life. But it doesn't tell you what they actually believe about abortion, because the vast majority of people in America oppose late-term abortion. So that forty, so you know, the forty-four percent of people who consider themselves pro-choice only 
you know, 3% of those people might support late-term abortion um, because most people believe that that the fetus is a fully formed human being by that time, so they don't believe that abortion is permissible in the late term. Uh, so, yeah, so so just that Gallup poll alone doesn't really tell you what people think of the abortion issue. It just kind of tells you that that they're, they're basically split among among political lines regarding the issue. So you really have to be careful about how the question is worded. Some studies are a lot um, a lot more informative than others based on how the questions are worded, based on the, the answers you can respond with, things like that. Yeah, so just to kind of wrap up from my angle, um, I think there's a significant reason to believe that a decent uh, number of the participants, uh, probably the majority of participants came out of a religious environment. Um, and when I say religious environment, I mean had religious parents or guardians and uh, participated in religious services probably there during their childhood. So, you know, they have this religious background and then they're coming out of that to be atheist and, you know, openly so. Um, and at that point, again, you have this sort of shift in identity and loss of community and so forth. And there's significantly less in the way of um, secular groups or organizations you can participate in, uh, which would give you that sense of community. I'm not saying that there are none. In fact, the paper said that those who participate in secular communities uh, tended to have less uh, instances of depression. Um, so that participation in that community, and that's what it boils down to. It's, it's community. It's a sense of belonging and identity. And so what you see in deconversion cases, at the very least, is that people come out, they're looking for a new identity, they're looking for a new community, and they turn to the atheist community. But the problem is when you get a bunch of atheists in the room, the only reason they're all in the same room is because of their feelings about religion. And so when you walk up to a random person in that crowd and start talking to them, the only thing that you know you can start talking to them about is the problems that they have with religion. So in order to keep the room cohesive, in order to keep everybody on the same page, in order to build that community, they have to focus on the one thing they all have in common, which is their negative feelings toward religion. They have to kind of cultivate that and keep it in the forefront of their, you know, their personality, at least in that community. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it's this sort of constant fostering of this negative attitude towards uh, religion that is part of their identity if they're going to, you know, be leaning on that as the community that they participate in. Um, and you can imagine what that would lead to. Yeah. Yeah, so, very, very much so. Um, yeah. Now, what I found in my studies is that, you know, the question is, this, this observation is that almost universally, as a person begins to de deconvert, they uh, start with what I call leftward drift, which is where they start from a very fundamentalist pos uh, position politically as well as religiously. And then as they uh, go through this deconversion career, they begin to uh, drift politically left. Um, and, you know, so that by the time they uh, leave the religion, they tend to be very much on the, uh, you know, the political uh, left side of the spectrum. Um, you know, and then the question is, well, does the deconversion cause the leftward drift or does the leftward drift cause the deconversion? And I think that the two, you know, based on what I'm looking at, the two tend to be simultaneous. So, you know, what's the arrow of causation? I don't think I have enough data to tell you that, but, you know, the bottom line is that this sort of political identity is very much entangled with their religious or irreligious identity. So it's not surprising to me that this poll, the whole you know, goal or thrust of the poll was to, you know, as a form of political activism. You know, this is what their identity is sort of built around now. You know, and I've heard this happen, you know, uh, asserted a number of times without, you know, a lot of, um, data to back it up that, you know, as an atheist, your, your politics is your religion. 
you know, and, you know, I, I'm not willing to commit to that, but I can see how that intuitively seems to make sense because I don't think I've ever met an atheist that wasn't very political in nature. And of course, you know, the study that I just pointed out to says that atheists are the most politically active group in the U.S. And then this paper itself, you know, it, it bottomed out with, hey, we vote. Uh, nuns don't necessarily vote, you know. So, uh, you know, how does that relate to one another? Um, I think at the end of the day, the persecution that they're talking about probably relates mostly to the power they believe that the religious right have in the political sphere. Um, and the fact that they see the religious right being the ones who are making these policy decisions in regards to things like LGBTQ rights and abortion and, you know, all the rest of this. Um, if the religious right didn't have any kind of political power, I doubt we'd be seeing this study. That's a good point. So yeah, that's the the bottom line for me. Um, any of anyone else want to kind of wrap this up from their perspective? Yeah, I, I do want to touch on one last thing that I think Christians need to take away uh, from from this kind of survey. You know, there are a couple points on this survey that that you know I was really touched by because it's like, man, that's that's awful. Um, you know, among younger participants, uh, that's age 18 to 24, um, 20% had reported that they had been threatened because of their non-religious identity. Hmm. Of course, as we touched on earlier, you know, 3% of that 18 to 24 population also reported actual physical violence against them in some shape or form. You know, if that's true, I mean, that is, that's a pretty high number of people who've experienced physical violence because they're stating they're not believing in a religion. So it, it, it just, you know, it should make you have some empathy for what people are going through. And it's up to Christians to change a lot of these things, to change how they're treating people, um, you know, because these kind of actions are only going to push for someone further in into atheism when they're treated this way by one group. And, you know, this this difficulty they're going through is recognized by the atheist community. We as Christians need to recognize that as well. And that some of these people have had extremely negative experiences with religion. Um, and until we begin to recognize that, and treat them with some gentleness and respect and genuine friendship and kindness uh, the way we would anyone who professed to be a Christian. Um, you know, until we treat them with that same degree of kindness that we would, uh, we're going to continue to see things like this. And we're going to continue to see the number of nuns rise, I think. Um, also, one other thing that just along the same vein is, is 38%. 37.9, to be precise, uh, were treated like they didn't understand the difference between right and wrong. I think some of this could be a misunderstanding as to how quick Christians present morality as an issue, um, but to be treated as if they don't understand the difference between right and wrong is, is a really, really poor apologetic, uh, because the fact that we do have these innate moral values and duties is, is very strong evidence for the fact that we have a God who has embodied us with these. So I think, you know, to have people treated like that and, you know, it may just be an offhand comment by someone, but you know, that again is a very poor apologetic. So not to, not to drag Christians through the mud on this one, but, you know, there are some things we can take from this survey and say, hey, you know what? We can work at doing better on these things to treat people with more kindness and to be careful with the words we choose in, in dealing with people and having discussions. Yeah, uh, to put it in 
in philosophy speak, it's the question of epistemology versus ontology, that atheism is not a worldview that can ground objective morality. And so when it comes to the epistemological question, we have to ask ourselves, uh, you know, epistemology being how do we know what we know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, how or what accounts for the fact that there are objective moral values and duties. Um, but the ontology question is, you know, whether or not something exists and, and what that thing is. And so just because an atheist can't account for it with their worldview doesn't mean they can't recognize it. You know, I, I sometimes use the example of a hammer that, you know, you can use a hammer despite not knowing where it came from or how it got there, you know, and, and in the same way, atheists can recognize morality they can they can do moral things even if they can't account for for how the more the moral you know facts of reality got there or they can't um, they, they can't ground it in their worldview um, you know even scripture itself says that God has written the moral law in in our hearts and so even scripture teaches that atheists can can do good things and can um, you know recognize right from wrong now obviously there are other scripture passages like on our best days you know our good deeds are like filthy rags but that doesn't that doesn't say that we can't do good deeds it just it just says that compared to all the bad stuff that we do our good stuff can't you know, wash away the bad stuff. But uh, but when it comes to actually doing moral things, atheists certainly can recognize right from wrong, even if we disagree on some things, you know, are, are homosexual acts permissible? Um, you know, is abortion permissible? Uh, there are some things that atheists definitely agree with us on. Is murder permissible? Is rape permissible? These are, these are things that atheists and Christians can find agreement on. Yeah. So, you know, I'd love to give a little bit of Christian takeaway on this, but it's not easy because, you know, I mean, let's say that this was a study on um, Muslims, you know, Muslims feeling per persecuted in society. Uh, well, I mean, it would be easy enough to say that, hey, you get to say, God bless you when somebody sneezes or, you know, you are being permitted to be a religious person in the public sphere. You need to allow them to be permitted to be a religious person in the public sphere you know, allow them to say their prayers at midday, allow them to, you know, do their various practices the way that you would want to as well. Um, so, you know, this is part of their identity. Uh, you know, this is something you need to respect and allow them to do, just like they would respect you saying grace over a meal or whatnot. But, you know, then flip it around to the atheist sphere. You know, let's say that I want to make sure atheists get an equal part of the pie, get to you know, practice the, the way that they want. My The problem here is that in order to avoid offending the atheists, you're not, allow, you're not allowing for them to do practices within the public sphere. You're having to curb your own practices within a public sphere. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, in order to kind of reduce the sense of persecution, you need to stop being, le you need to start being less Christian, you know, in the public sphere, because mm -hmm. that's the problem for them. It's not that they're not being allowed to practice, you know, certain atheist type rights <laughs> uh, within the public sphere. It's because right. you're practicing too many Christian rights within the public sphere. So this is, you know, looking at the survey, it's difficult to see a compromise on this. You know, if it was a Muslim survey, you know, you could try to be less abusive towards Muslims. Okay. You know, and that's, that's uh, the takeaway that Caleb gave with this. You know, you need to allow allow for the fact that they're atheists and not be abusive towards that and be accepting towards that. And I'm fine with that. You know I mean? If that's the problem, then that's a solution to the problem. Don't be mean to them because they're atheists. <laughs> Accept right. that, allow them to be that, respect that, you know, as their worldview mm. and so forth. And I'm all about that. But the problem is that, you know, you're seeing this and it's the microaggression piece. It's the fact that you're wearing a crucifix that, you know, you say, well, thank God that didn't have, you know, the tornado missed the trailer park or whatnot. Mm. Um, you know, you say grace over your meal. You, you in, a, in essence, you be Christian. You know, that's part of your identity. You act that way. And that's what's bothering them. That's what's causing the sense of persecution. Um, and so you need to stop being so Christian in order to stop persecuting them. Um, no, I, I mean, I think there are definite things that can be done, like Caleb was saying. You know, accept them. Don't be abusive towards them. Respect them, you know. Um, but in addition to that, they would prefer that you remove religious symbols from the public sphere, which mm -hmm. means, you know, curb your Christianity. 
you know, be less Christian, keep that out of the face. Mm. Um, no, ultimately, I think if they were getting their various political um, check marks checked, you know, uh, LGBTQ rights and abortion and um, I don't know what the others were, uh, climate change and whatnot, you know, would the study be the same? You know, if I'm saying God bless you in public, but, you know, there is unlimited access to abortion and contraceptives, is that the balance? Is that, you know, are they happy at this point? Which is the real issue here? I don't know. Um, So, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, Caleb gave the best advice, try to respect them, you know, allow them to be who they are. But it seems like they a little want a little more than that at the end of the day, uh, which I don't see how I could be a faithful Christian and also, you know, give the com- kind of compromise that they would like uh, to happen here. And and I think that, you know, like you said, I don't think there's a way to to kind of pinpoint it and say how much is too much. I think that what we can say is is we can ask ourselves um are we christian in the right ways so you know are are our acts and our love for people leading the way in showing that there's something different about us or is it because of our symbolism and because we pray before every meal or you know because of our bumper sticker or because we're going to hit somebody over the head with our bible you know is it those kind of things that are showing we're christian or is it is it our genuine acts of kindness towards other people and really following that example jesus gave and i th- i think that's the only question we can ask ourselves with with this kind of information is is are we are we christian in the right ways are we doing the things we're actually called to or are we outwardly appearing as a christian and claiming the name and not doing anything inwardly or outwardly to express that yeah well you know i mean part of this was this idea of not being accepted by the family or not being accepted by the community and that's something we can work with you know i've you know, I recently had a conversation about how can we, um, how should we respond to somebody who is going through a deconversion experience? And, you know, my response had to be, let them go through the experience, listen to them, you know, uh, get what their perspective is and don't try to beat them over the head or win them back. Cause that's just going to drive them further away from you. You know, that's going to uh, break that relationship. And I know as, as difficult as it might be for a Christian to hear this, if they're going to deconvert, they're going to deconvert. If they're going to be an atheist, they're going to be an atheist. Your classic evangelism is not going to change that. It might make it worse. So, you know, similar to what Caleb is saying here, you know, accept them. Um, be respectful of them. You know, accept that they have a difference from you. And, you know, I mean, discuss the difference, absolutely, in a respectful way. You know, have that conversation to the degree that they're willing. But you can still love them as a person, you know, if your family member decides to, you know, go the atheist route, Clinton. um, You know, you can still love them as a person. You can still listen to them. You can understand their point of view and respect it. Um, And you don't have to abandon them or, you know, feel uncomfortable around them or try to win them back or, you know, browbeat them back into the fold or whatnot. You right. know, ultimately, as a Christian, it is my belief that God is in charge of these things, and it's not my responsibility and it's not my failing as a person if somebody decides that they disagree with me. You know, even if it's a close family member, I've got children, eventually one of them might walk away, and that would be difficult but I've got to live with that. I've got to allow them to be their own person and make those decisions. And, you know, if I trust God, I trust God. Here, here. So, yeah, that's something we might be able to work with as well. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think I think that uh, rounded it out rather nicely. I've, I've certainly enjoyed the discussion with you guys. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think this was an interesting piece of research to look at, if if nothing else. I mean, it was it was interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't see a reason why a Christian should be intimidated by this. You know, the, the thing that I would say is, um, I don't know. Yes, being a minority group in a majority society is stressful because you know that the people you're walking past in the street don't necessarily share your values. So that is, you know, that is absolutely true. Um, and that's, that's what is what it is. Okay. We're wrapping up. So for listeners, uh, you can follow us on the Facebook, um, page and you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And, you know, we have our, uh, Patreon page and we have a regular podcast that's updated there. And for higher, you know, we've got one person who's on our book of the month club. Um, and we've been sending some pretty good apologetics books his way. Uh, it would be nice to have a few more, right. Yeah, but, uh, well, I'm yeah. sure that person is quite appreciative <laughs> of yeah. all the books he's getting. So, yep. And so consider por- uh, supporting on Patreon or if not, then, you know, give us a five-star review on your pod catcher of choice or here on YouTube, leave your yeah, uh, hit, comments. Hit that and like will... button and hit that subscribe button. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> and, if and you don't forget to comments, ring the bell, too. Can... <laughs> yeah, ding, ding. there you go. Uh, <laughs> eventually, we'll get to that point. Yeah, but if you leave comments beneath the show uh, and want those addressed in a future show, we'll definitely take care of that. All right. See you later, gentlemen. Yep, see you later. Out.